Hi everyone, welcome to another instalment of Vitality Speaker Series, our monthly webinar aimed at financial advisors about bigger picture issues. I'm Adam Savile, Intermediary Editor for Vitality, and before I introduce our, our very special guest for today, the brilliant Baroness Tani Gray Thompson, I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you a bit about what else we've got going on for the rest of the Vitality Speak Series Spring Summer Programme. So during Mental Health Awareness Week on the 11th of May, I'll be in conversation with television personality Simon Thomas to, dis to discuss life after loss. Simon sadly suddenly lost his first wife to leukemia just over three years ago. And he's since spoken about how he's dealt with traumatic gr gr grief and how a life insurance policy gave him the headspace that he needed to look after his young son as he re rebuilt his life. So that's during Mental Health Awareness Week on the 11th of May. Then to close the programme, I'm joined by Peter uh, Komalafi, ex-financial advisor and podcast host, who will join us to discuss the cost of living crisis and how financial advisors can best meet the needs of clients in the present climate. So some really great sessions lined up there. So please keep an, your eye out for our email updates and register or, or register via the Vitality Advisor website to book your place. Right, now, on to today's session. It's my great pleasure to welcome ex-Paralympian, multiple gold winning medal, uh, gold medal winner, Tani Gray Thompson to join us today. Hi, Tani. Hi, good morning. It's always a relief when the webcam works, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's great. We can see you, we can hear you. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing? Yeah, really good, thank you. Yeah, good. So, Tani, mentioning just your athletic achievements is, is only really telling part of the story. You've worked as a television presenter, served as a politician, member of the House of Lords, and you're currently chair of UK Active, where your tenure ends in, in June, and at which point you'll, you'll start your role as chair of Sports Wales as part of the Welsh Government. I mean, that's, that's quite, a, quite a list. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I like being busy. Um, so, you know, obviously as an athlete, you know, I'm, I'm deeply involved in sport and, and activity. And then it's quite a privilege to be able to carry on working in that space once I retired from competing. So um, UK Active's been uh, amazing. Uh, it's a massive privilege to work with people you like. Uh, and I've been able to do that. And uh, I've done sort of two terms at UK Active and uh, then uh, I applied for the role of Sport Wales Chair. And then they've literally sort of bookend each other so uh I'm, I'm not going too far from the space of physical activity and trying to get people moving which is is great to stay involved in a slightly different way brilliant and, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today um looking at physical activity the role of sport in the community community especially in light of the pandemic but also we'll touch upon how the health and protection insurance industry the private sector can also play its part um, especially given the government's uh, initiative social prescribing um, but before we dig into that and unpack some of those things um, let's start with you and your background and go all the way back to sort of how you first got into athletics uh, and sport and, and physical activity how that kind of what quite well that played in your life from a very young age so I was born with a condition called spina bifida and uh, I could walk a, a little bit when I was young I could never walk very well actually um, I don't have any bones um, protecting the back of my spine, part of my spinal cord. So um, as I grew up, uh, my spine collapsed and it was my own vertebra that severed my spinal cord that paralyzed me. So I kind of smile about it because, you know, people usually sort of say, oh, wow, that's, but it, it didn't hurt. There wasn't any pain. I didn't miss a day of school. You know, it just very, very gradually happened. And I, I, I learned to adjust to that as I went along. And the, by the time um, I became a wheelchair user, I think my parents had adapted really well too, because there were lots of people who told my parents all the things I'd never do by being a wheelchair user. And my parents just ignored it all, to be honest, which was amazing. Um, um, I grew up in a really sporty family. Um, and at the beginning, it was just about being physically active. You know, it wasn't about a Paralympic pathway. My dad was an architect and he realized how inaccessible the world was. And he realized I had to learn to push my chair around in it. So, um, 
it was about being fit and strong enough to do that. And then as time went on, you know, into my early teens, I found other sports and I found wheelchair racing and I loved it. And I joined a club and got a coach, Roy Anthony, and and it just sort of went went from there really. And then when I retired, it's come back to being physically active again. You know, as I get older, every year gets a bit harder. I get a bit slower in my racing chair. You know, I'm not training the way that I used to, but um, so f physical activity is a really important part of every day because I, I want to hit frailty when I'm 95, not when I'm 55. It's, it's um, fascinating that the the idea that, that physical activity could be the thing that that, that can help us sort of stay strong, um, and it, you know how it changes throughout our, our lifestyle. And and your your pathway, it's just been an incredibly inspirational one. Um, and I remember watching you um, in the Olympics when I was when I was uh, you know younger. I think I was in my early teens, and I was really amazed by by seeing you um, compete in the in the Paralympics. And win gold medals but you've had to overcome some pretty pretty big barriers to, to kind of get to to where you got to um and from i could just sort of hear that in your in your sort of story just then um so how is sport a kind of a, a kind of or, or activity physical activity when it comes to overcoming barriers um what what you mentioned it was for you it was the thing that you just had to do just to kind of like you know become stronger um, how did you kind of, what was it that pushed you through those, those barriers? Um, certainly when I started wheelchair racing, it was, you know, I just wanted to be the best I could be, but also, you know, training then and now gives me headspace. You know, if, if I'm having a long and difficult day in politics, going to the gym or going out for a walk or whatever it is, just helps me in everything that I do and you know I definitely I sleep better I eat better I'm able to kind of tackle each day you know and we, we work really 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 odd hours in politics um you know last night I, I left the building at midnight um you know and I've been in since past nine in the morning so you know you you don't have um a, a regular pattern in in terms of being able to do things so you know I, I think the, the barriers that I had a lot of the more barriers that any athlete would have in terms of selection and and you know you know training hard enough not being injured keeping everything together I think in terms of disability my parents protected me from a lot of that and you know anyone who treated me differently my mum would be well they're an idiot so ignore them so you know I, I think it just shows the people you have around you um, make a massive difference and you see that in the work that I do now you know with you know especially a lot of uh, stuff around young women you know if if you don't give um, young women the right experience of physical activity and the right sort of induction into sport, they find it really hard. And, you know, we've seen in the last year, you know, a million and a half young, young women have dropped out of sport and activity because they don't think it's for them. And that has, I mean, I find that really sad on a, you know, as an ex-athlete, but also for their long-term health and mental wellbeing, that that's an issue for the whole country, you know? So, you know, I, I do realise I get on my soapbox about about this because it's about the individual, but it's actually about us as a nation, you know, in terms of us being competitive on a world stage, not Olympics and Paralympics, but as an economy, we need fit and healthy people. Um, and it's one of those things that never quite gets to the top of the politician's to-do list, you know, and, and as individuals, we know it's really important to be active, um, but it's too easy to go, oh, well, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it next week. And I guess what being an athlete taught me is you can't you have to do it every day you know you can't suddenly make up a load of training in you know in a week um and and i think that sort of just instilled a sense of urgency into me in terms of what we're doing now but it's about motivation so you know as an athlete it was really easy to be motivated because you've got worlds or europeans or commonwealths you've got something coming up you know these days it's a bit harder so you know like most people i've got I've got a couple of wearables you know, and, you know, you, you you need something that that sort of ticks you along and, and, and gets you out there doing stuff, which, you know, the, the motivation is is something that really interests me. Yeah. Yeah. So having those kind of those nudges to, to um, you know, assist and motivate. Um, so you mentioned something very interesting there around, I guess, around the kind of the, the government's levelling up strategy is kind of, I guess, where the, the where the illusion was. Um, Young women, for example, not having enough access accessibility or to, to, to sort of support or to or even the right kind of education. Um, 
do you think we kind of lack that then? Do you think that's where it starts? Does it start with um, giving people access to the tools that they need from a very young age, the education, the knowledge of how to, it's not just about, you know, kind of, um, I mean, I remember physical education lessons at school, you know, you know, it's not just about kind of running around a, a field a few times, right? You know, is it well, understanding maybe other aspects to it, the, the benefits, the science? What are the things that we kind of were lacking, Tani? Yeah, um, it is about education. So if I could wave a magic wand, I would have fully trained PE teachers in every single primary school in the country. So if we look at the Olympic stats, a lot of our Olympic medalists come from independent schools. That's a combination of facilities. Um, some of it's about money, although not every child who goes to an independent school has, you know, really well off parents. Um, and it's about teaching um, physical literacy. It's, it's teaching the building blocks of what you have to do. We don't teach trigonometry without teaching maths, but we expect children to play sport without teaching them the skills. So the, the sporty kids, will you know jump ahead and then they it, it's easier for them to keep staying ahead and we the reality is we value sporty boys more than we value sporty girls um and and it still is i think difficult you know i think young women are under huge huge pressure you know to have your hair a certain way or to dress a certain way or to have the right handbag and you know stuff that i didn't have growing up um and you know there's there's data out there that shows um in changing rooms in in schools if you put hair dryers in the girls changing rooms they're more likely to do physical activity and have a shower afterwards now you could argue any way you want that you know should should teenage girls be worried about what their hair looks like well you know that that doesn't matter it's 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 finding the tools to to get them to do it but you know we know we're meant to have five fruit and veg a day actually the real number's higher it's just that's what the government thought people could deal with you know, for me, it's easy because I think, right, I'm going to go and do a physical activity because of all my knowledge as an athlete. I can think of lots and lots of different things to do. But if you haven't had a good experience of it, you, you don't necessarily know the things you can do to, to get your heart rate up or for you to feel comfortable or safe or, you know, want to do it. And, you know, lockdown, as I know we're going to talk about, you know, the first lockdown, you know, I saw loads of women out on bikes that... I've obviously never ridden a bike before because you could tell because all their seat heights were wrong. And I, I started going out. I know I sound slightly mad. Um, I started going out with a set of spanners and wet wipes and, and shouting at women saying, stop, stop. Right, here's, here's the man. This is, and um, Chris saw you had a really good video online about how to set your, your seat height. And I was like, go and watch the Chris I video. Um, so, um, because actually if you don't enjoy it, you know, they were doing it then out of necessity. You're not going to come back and do it. And we know place is important. Um, you know, people want to get back to facilities, but people are important as well. And, um, you know, I, I could just, you know, talk about this for hours, but we, we've got to connect to people for them to, to, to think about what they can do. And it is about teaching them what to do. So they've got a toolbox that they know 10 different things they can do to, to be active. You know, it's, it's not just naturally going out for a run or getting on a bike. There's lots of things you can do in your house without having to go outside. Yeah, the, the idea of, of um, encouraging people to do it in the first place is an interesting one, isn't it? it? You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't necessarily make it drink. So you mentioned earlier that there's an awareness that, that we, you know, that physical activity is good for us. There's awareness we should have our five bits of fruit a day, um, but actually doing it is kind of, is the, is the, is the hard part. It's, it's interesting you touched upon there about how actually awareness of how to do it is often the, the thing that helps people do it. And, and I think the, the lockdown anecdote you gave is a, a really good one because we were forced into, I mean, many of us were forced into, um, you know, going out the house um, at a time we wouldn't normally go out the house because we had nothing else to do, right? Or we were stuck in, indoors. Um, going to the, the forest down the road, for example, or uh, walking around the block or, or taking a trip around the block um, that we wouldn't normally normally take. And, and you mentioned people on bikes, right? Um, so we were forced into it to a degree because of the lockdown and we saw a newfound appreciation of, of, um, of physical activity, the, not just the physical benefits, because I, I personally, from my own personal experience, found working in, indoors all day 
uh, getting out and out of the house for a walk gave me not just physical benefits but also mental health benefits as well right you know the kind of feeling of de-stressing kind of the physical the, the, the positive impact that physical activity can have on our on our mental well-being um how are we where are we at now you know i, I mean we've, we've now come out of lockdown obviously um a lot of us are returning to, to offices uh, a lot of us are working hybrid in between working at home and uh working in offices but but we're, we're busy i mean we're, i mean we're always we're busy but uh but we're out more active within our lifestyles so are you finding that 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 are you seeing in any of the trends um, that the physical activity levels are have improved, have have gone down? Are, are we still uh, appreciative of, of 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 bike riding in the same way we were, for example, as a, as a nation? Yeah, um, it, it it's always a bit rolling to be honest. And so for me, first lockdown, I did loads more on my bike, which was amazing because I wasn't travelling, um, and that was great. What I didn't realise until probably the end of first lockdown was just the I say walking, but like the walking around that I do every day, I was actually missing that. So, you know, Parliament's a really big building and I was probably walking four or five miles around the building a day. Just, you know, that's kind of extra pennies in the bank on terms of training. So the end of first lockdown where I thought I was going to get really, really, really fit, I actually ended up slightly less fit than I started um, because I wasn't doing all the additional stuff. So that was um, a, a really interesting learning curve for, for, for me as well. And you're right. people are always busy um but um it's whether with the hybrid model, and we we don't know what was everyone's still working out what this new model of working is going to look like and if it is a couple of days a week in the office and a couple of days a week at home i i'd really like businesses and companies to think about how they inspire their workforce to think about their their physical activity now some companies you know have gyms or provide gym membership or do lots of really interesting things but I think it's got to come down from the top. It's got to come down from the senior leadership team and the chief exec. And, um, you know, there's there's one company I know where, you know, the CEO goes in to, and they're very, you know, they've got their own gym, but they go into the gym at lunchtime and everybody sees the boss doing it. So they feel that, that they can do it. And, mm. and, you know, it's, it's also, it's about productivity. You know, it's, a, it's about ha having, you know, employees that fit and healthy and well and, you know have good mental health and well-being so you know it's I'd, I'd love to see companies you know do more and with with my UK active hat on you know we've been talking to the treasury for a couple of years um about um a scheme we call work out from work which is about trying to to help businesses help their employees uh with memberships and um to, to be active and just being really creative it's a bit like the cycle to work scheme just being really creative until uh, um, in terms of how they can put physical activity into the day because it's it can be you know really hard to do it and once you miss a day then it gets easier and easier to, to miss so if you build it in as a habit then it it becomes easier to stick to it we've seen that in our in our own research uh, so the our Brits healthiest workplace survey for example that finds that the more physical activity and the more physically active employees are the more productive they are uh, and and that and that creates benefits not just for, for employees themselves but also for businesses too. Um, and it's we also saw in our in our member data at Vitality during lockdown that um, through the Vitality program we were able to encourage our members to to get get, get active even despite lockdown rest restrictions. Um, and we saw better levels of uh, activity for those who did um, contribute or or, or, or um, uh, who did to take part in the vitality program and have a wearable you mentioned wearables earlier they had a, a wearable they were more active than those that weren't so that that was um, a really really interesting bit of a bit of insight that we, we we've seen and, and and like you say as we've come out of lockdown we're more we're more active I mean I'm, I'm definitely you know reaching more physical active levels because I'm just more I'm moving around more I'm going into 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 the office more often um, but I'm having less time to to, to work out and do and do my, my routine. Um, so, what what do you, would you like to see more of? You mentioned you'd like to see employers um, kind of um, kind of in, 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 introduce physical activity into the workplace more. Um, We've, we'll touch upon social prescribing, maybe, because I know you'll, you've been very active in, in kind of raising the profile of that as a as a uh, as an initiative. So let's quickly start by uh, quickly unpacking for for our viewers 
what is what, what is social prescribing? What, what, what if for those that aren't aware of, of what the term means? What, what what does it mean? So what it is is about um, encouraging doctors to not prescribe medication, but to prescribe physical activity or art. I mean, there's a whole range of things that you can do for that, but it's about connecting to that individual. Again, it's the motivation, um, and it's it's partly about keeping people off medication and keeping people out of the NHS. Um, and you know something like type 2 diabetes, you can do a huge amount of that with um, exercise and diet as opposed to just going straight to, to medication. 66% um, of cancer prehab and rehab takes place in the physical activity center, you know, in gyms and leisure centers. So, you know, it's we, one of the amazing things with COVID, you know, I think everyone has a you know, I think most people appreciate the NHS, but, you know, there was this huge sort of surge in warmth for, for the NHS, but it's not sustainable in its current format. And actually, we need to keep people out of the NHS. So, you know, what we see is, you know, traditionally GPs don't get um, a lot of training in how to write a prescription for activity. Um, so, you know, and they've got seven minutes. So it's much easier and quicker to write a script for for medication than it is to, to find out what motivates people and what they need to change. But um, the social prescribing, it's been around for a long time. I think what's changing is there are now a lot more link workers, a lot of people who can spend time with the individual to kind of make that connection. And, you know, a, a friend of mine, um, you know, said to me a couple of years ago, she wants to be more physically active. And I came up with loads of suggestions based on the fact I'd known her a really long time and all these things, and none of them worked. And actually what connected for her was military fitness, was, you know, which I never, based on how well I thought I knew it, you know, I didn't think that connection would work, but it did. So, you know, that's why I talk a lot about motivation and connection, because you you can do it once or you can do it twice, but it's it's about the habit. And the, the great stuff with social prescribing, it's, it's also about friendships and it's about social connection. You know, loneliness is a massive problem in this country as well. And that's where, um, you know, obviously I'd, I'd love every prescription for social prescribing to be go and do an activity, but it can be art, it can be knitting, but actually you can be active to get to the knitting club or, you know, so there's just loads of ways that you, you can build it up. Um, and NHS England's invested uh, in social prescribing because they see it as a, a massive opportunity to change behaviour and change culture. Um, which is, is again, what we, we all need to do to keep people out of the NHS. So I mentioned it was a, a, a government initiative. Is, is, is it driven by the government or is it something that the, the, the NHS have, have supported and, and it's, it's kind of started outside of the government? Um, it's been around a long time. It just hasn't necessarily had um, the profile that it's starting to have now. Um, and seed funding from NHS England really helps in terms of you know employing people but also the different home countries do things in in quite different ways depending you know on on devolution so you know in wales you know it's much easier for the government departments to talk to each other because they're kind of just closer and there's less people so you know in wales it's very interesting how um you know education and health and sport are able to connect to each other in a better way and you know they've they've got well-being legislation in Wales, which is also really exciting because it's looking at sort of the whole person. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's quite, a, it, so it's still too much of a postcode lottery. That's the reality of it. Um, and, you know, it can be affected by socioeconomic background and education and all these things because, you know, you you might not have somewhere close to you that, that has the thing that you connect to. So we, and it comes back to what you said about the levelling up. You know, my, my hope for levelling up is it joins a lot of those things together. The reality is government works in silos. Everyone I know in politics keeps saying we should stop working in silos, but it's really hard to to, to make that connection. So I was, I was part of a select committee last year and we actually wanted to move sport from DCMS to health. Um, because actually sport is a tiny part of the whole physical activity. You know, if you think about it as a Venn diagram, Sport and elite sports, a teeny bit of it, you know, there's physical, literally, physical, all the other bits. And, and actually health is a more natural home for it. Um, the government don't quite agree with us on it. But, but you know, if you have a major game and you talk about the legacy, you, you talk about the health legacy and the activity legacy of the games 
as opposed to when are we going to get another sporting event so um yeah we, we keep Colin Monaghan a few others we, we keep working on that because ultimately if everyone's fitter and healthier we'll get more people into sport and more people into elite sport so there's a, there's a lot in that, Tanya. I'd love, love to dig into some various strands of some of the things you just covered. I will pause briefly, though, just remind our viewers, please do ask your questions to, to Tani in the chat facility or the uh, questions box. We will have some time at the end to ask Tani those questions and any comments you might have. Um, but there was lots in there. So you touched upon um, prevention and, and kind of I think it's also very important to distinguish the difference between physical activity and physical exercise, because actually I think the World Health Organization has slightly different definition as, as to what they mean and, and you mentioned health as well you know and how physical activity um should be brought in to, underneath the banner of health and, and not kept as kind of a as that narrow definition which i guess brings in fitness exercise sport um because this is about getting people more active because it because it benefits their their physical uh, well-being and their mental well-being and a small amount of activity can be, can have a, have a big make a big positive impact and it, it sounds like, from what you're saying, Tani, um, across the board, I like, you know, I like the example you gave in, in Wales, where it feels like this more centralised approach kind of does actually mean that there's more of a connection. However, um, it sounds as if across the board in the UK, even at government level, we, we, we sort of maybe lack, um, there's, a, there's, an, there's, a, there's an opportunity, perhaps, to better to define and, and put into context the benefits of physical activity unpack them a little bit um, and build them into the prevention agenda that our government very rightly has been talking very openly about, you know, prevention is better than cure, right? That was kind of part of the health strategy for the past five years or so. So, but, but it feels like physical activity is, is kind of not, is almost a kind of a, a stone that hasn't been quite overturned yet. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, a lot of us would say, you know, we're a nation that loves sport. We're actually a nation that loves watching sport. And we played quite a bit of sport, but and, and it's one of those things that I'm, I'm much more careful with my language now. Because I I used to probably say sport when I meant physical activity and I meant all these other things. And it's great. It's one of those things. If you're in the world, you understand all the differences. To to a lay person on the street, they don't really care about the definitions of it. But that sort of comes back to education. And the reality is, if we want to change behaviour, there's not one thing that we do. So it is about you know, talking to the Department for Education uh, about teacher training. It's about talking to the institutions that train teachers. Um, you know, in primary school, I think, you know, the, the teacher that, you know, sometimes delivers PE is the sporty teacher. So that might be the person who goes to Zumba. You know, they no, don't necessarily have a lot of training. And I always think, can you imagine 35 year old children, you know, 35 year old? five-year-olds you know what I mean um you know who were all at different levels of ability and interest and and it's slightly like herding sheep um mm. and it is really tough at that age to find something that fits every level of ability and interest and, and all those different things so you can see why um within the time they have you know they they might play certain games and, and do things in, the, in a certain way you know I I would love it um you know to and, and there's a lot of schools that do this now and there's a lot of different schemes that you know daily mile gold mile who you know do a little bit of activity at the start of every day and i remember going to a school um pre-lockdown and you always know the child that the teacher doesn't want you to talk to because you can see that they sort of steering the child away from you and it's like i need to talk to that boy so i, I went over and i said oh do you like it and he's like hated it when I first started. I went okay. And he said, but it's all right now. So what was it? And he said, um, I I don't get sent out of class as much. And it's like okay. And you know, this was a sort of eight year old who was able to fairly well articulate that you know he didn't sleep well and he played games late and you know did all sorts of things and then behaved badly in school and then got sent out of class and then because he was missing it then behaved more. And, and so that's not going to fix every child, you know. I'm, 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 you know, not naive enough to think that. But, um, you know, we, it, it connections again, and and find. So yeah, so I started saying, you know, there's not not one lever. You know, we've got to talk to treasury, we've got to talk to health, we've got to talk to DCMS, education. It's 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 got to join all those up together in a better way. It's an example as well that, that uh, anecdote you just gave about the eight-year-old uh, boy. It's an example of how um, physical activity is often overlooked as a, as a solution. 
Um, and look, it's not the entire solution, but it, but it's a it's a part of the solution that should be maybe investigated more more fully um, and understood better. Um, I, I I think turning back to social prescribing then and, and kind of the role of, of, of and not just physical activity, but we're talking about physical activity right now. And um, I, I guess there's once you've got the buy-in from GPs, for example, to uh, willingly make suggestions to um, to give them activities or give them social circles, community activities, um, to give them access to them or suggest access to them. I guess delivering that is 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 something that also um, needs to be done fairly carefully and with with understanding so do we feel as if and not to make massive generalizations but but is the health system set up enough to i mean you spoke about treating the whole person and and one aspect of that that i guess maybe doesn't get as much attention is the the social aspect of for that for that individual not just the physical and the nutrition and the, and the, and the kind of the health and the medicinal that kind of we mentioned uh, earlier um the social aspect well, at what point do gps almost have to become uh, more than they, you know, broaden their remit. They're more than just kind of prescribing medicine and, and diagnosing illness and referral. Mm. Actually, have an access point into community. And you mentioned it's a bit of a postcode lottery, but I guess what I'm asking is, is, are is the NHS set up in a way to be able to open those doors sufficiently enough yet, or or does the private sector potentially have a, have a role to play? I mean, everyone has a role to play in it. I, I don't think the NHS is set up yet to be able to do it. And, and there will need to be, you know, multiple forms of provision to enable it to happen. I think with social prescribing, that's where the link workers are incredibly important because it's about... So the link worker would come in at the point of the GP would then put the patient to... A, to yeah. uh, would direct them to a link worker or a, or a support broker of some kind and they would... They would then um, get them access to, to the right. And, and that person has more time um, to, to actually just know all the things that are out there, um, you know, because actually it's not possible for an individual, you know, if you've had no exposure to physical activity or you, you don't know what the local clubs are or the, the local associations are, you know, it's, it's even with sort of day and age of modern technology, it's quite hard to find out what those things and if you've never tried it how do you know whether you're going to like it or not so I mean coming back to my time you know as a young athlete I remember my dad saying you know don't say you don't like a sport till you've tried it you know but but how do you know and you know luckily they were like well okay try tennis try swimming try this try basketball um but but how do you know what's out there um and it's it's then about you know a little bit of trial and error to to some extent but you know that that the social side, I don't think we talk anywhere near enough about the social side of it. Um, and, you know, what I, um, when gyms opened back up for the first time, um, you know, I kind of was straight back in the gym and it was amazing. And it was really interesting how you, in a different way, you could spot all the new members. Well, I suppose because you, you, you saw them walking around, not quite sure what to do with some of the equipment. And what was amazing was loads of people would stop and say do you know how to use this let me show you how to use it this is what you do and i i guess i've never seen anything like that before and i think partly you know it's because of covid it's because of lots of different things it's about social connection but that sort of camaraderie was and i think people then just being so happy to be you didn't take it for granted anymore because we probably did take it a little bit for granted before you know that you could go to these places and everyone's so happy to be back you kind of wanted everyone to have a a really good time being back in in the place um and and i've seen a lot of that i know it's anecdotal but i've seen a lot of that continue which is is really lovely yeah you don't know what you've got till it's gone right that's kind of one of the key learnings of the of the pandemic um and i suppose we all, I like that point you made. That we all have a role to play, and, and and I guess it starts with the individual. It starts with the individual having access to 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 what they would need, um, mm. and that's those social elements. I mean, um, through the Voters Vitality Program, for example, Park Run is is a very very popular um, benefit that that yeah. we incentivise through um, extra points are, are earned. 
if you go and take uh, take part in a park run, not only are you getting your activity, but you also there's an opportunity to, to meet people and get out and about. And, and there is a community aspect to that. Um, and I guess the incentive, we, we talked earlier about kind of the nudges or the incentives that can be used to encourage people to yeah. get out and do the things that they might otherwise be reluctant to do, um, whether it's the offer of a, of a, of a free coffee or a, um, or an earned coffee, we should probably say, um, or um, or kind of the opportunity to get uh, money off of their uh, Apple Watch, for example. Th yeah. Those those incentives can often be the thing that kind of nudges people into a, into a routine where before they weren't necessarily um, that keen to do it. Um, so that they I mean, I'm not comparing that directly to social prescribing, but but I, I guess I'm kind of kind of giving a sense of kind of how the private sector or an insurance company in, in Vitality's mm. case could actually pr perform some of the some of the benefits that that we would look to get from that kind of holistic approach to health and well-being that we that we are hoping that maybe the NHS could provide through social prescribing. Yeah and, and just by absolute luck I, I met a friend's daughter last week and we were comparing wearables and um, hadn't seen for a while she's quite an outdoor sporty person and then she, and actually it was through Vitality, which was, I was like, oh, that's, that's a good connection. Um, and, you know, she, she was just saying it, you know, it just was that extra push, you know, every day. I said, you know, she could have gone out and bought the watch without, you know, got a good job, not particularly thinking about it. But actually it's, it's kind of that interesting thing, isn't it, that you... You get a bit of a bargain or you get something and you know you know the earned coffee it's it that connects to people in in totally different ways and you know the cost of a coffee is not very much but it gets people and i think parkrun is fascinating i mean i love it I and mean, uh, um i think there is something in not putting a number on um and that you know there are people there who are hugely competitive you know um, and want to win and you know and then um, you know people people walk in, and I think it's a really really smart idea in terms of how it it can be a race if you want it to be, but it's not a race if you don't want it to be. And they've tapped into something, and linking to that, I think is brilliant. You know, they've tapped into something that that gets people out, um, you know, week in week out in the way that races i don't think do you know for me when i was an athlete yeah they do because you just do it that's what you do that's your job um but i think you know park run is 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 fascinating um and uh i i love it i just i haven't done one for a little while but uh yeah it's 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 an interesting connection for people i know i talk about connections a lot but it's got to be that thing that you know you wake up in the morning and you go right what am i going to do today and i know you know the you know, I got in really late last night from work and it's like, OK, I probably need to go to sleep. But, you know, I did half an hour of my weights because I know today I will feel better for it. Yeah, yeah. And, and with Parkrun as well, that, that the 5K distance as well is is a long enough. I had one recently uh, and it's, it's long enough to put you through your paces. Yeah. But it's it's not so long that it puts me off uh, and, and and you know i'm no kind of like you know um i'm not a kind of a marathon runner for example um but it's it's yeah it, it, i think a 10k could be like could be about oh on a saturday morning oh you know it's a bit much <laughs> i think there's a kind of see he needs these sometimes these incentives if they're achievable that makes a big difference and it goes back to our point earlier about that we spoke about the distinguishing the difference between physical activity and physical exercise we're talking about just getting out more we're not talking about you have to become you know like a a, a marathon runner you have to yeah. you know you know you do a kind of a, a hell runner or whatever they're called or you know one of those kind of like a triathlon you know we're talking about kind of like achievable goals that just not only give you some extra you know give, give you some extras like i said some kind of you know extra rewards and benefits but mm -hmm. actually get you out and make you feel help you to help you to feel better i think that's the kind of the the messages that kind of the, the financial advisors could potentially be getting across to their clients yeah I mean, what you say about achievable goals is really important because when i was an athlete we'd do 5k warm-up before a training session you know i didn't that was warm-up you didn't even think about the distance i used to kind of do marathons without you know didn't really 
that you'd be a bit tired, a bit sore for two days afterwards, and then you're back into training, you know, because that's the world of an elite athlete. And um, I did a 10K last year, a local 10K, I live in the Northeast, Redka 10K. And again, I used to do that without thinking about it. First kilometer was amazing. Uh, and I was actually pushing really quickly. And my husband was on his bike and I was like, you know what? I, just, I mean, it was downhill with a bit of a tailwind and then I hit, it wasn't a climb. I never would have considered a climb. These days it's a climb. And I went, oh, this is this is quite hard. And my my goal for it was um, to, to finish the 10K slightly quicker than my half marathon personal best, which I just about, yeah, I mean, it's really slow. But um, with, with my husband pointing out in, you know, the good old days, I would have been 11K further down the road. It's like, thanks for that. Um, but But I kind of finished and it was like, I felt really good. And it was the slowest 10K I've ever done in my whole life. And, and, you know, and I was like, I did it. And one of the guys from our running club was like, why are you so excited? You know, cause it doesn't, but it's like, it does compare. I felt like I've really achieved something, you know, and I, you know, I, and he was like, oh, isn't that sweet? You're you know? a, you're a Paralympian multi gold, gold medal winner. Uh, and, a, and a 10K is, is giving you that amount. <laughs> um, I've got a really about great question. Your goals. I've got a really great comment. Yes, yeah, it's it's, and our goals change change actually as we as we get older. Um, we had um, Gabby Gabby Logan on the on the speaker series quite recently, and she mentioned um, that as she got into her her midlife, um, she found that her exercise approach changed, and it became more about strength building. And you and it kind of reminded me of, of what you said earlier on. Um, and for her, it's about kind of building it, making sure that we don't become frail. Mm. And and I think. That's something that I've definitely taken on board because um, I think we often associate weight training, uh, especially men, sort of associate weight training with with kind of vanity, right? And kind of you know getting buff. Uh, and and actually, it, it, for me, it's kind of like the idea if I can be, become strong in later life, that's going to be you know in the future. And one of the things that social prescribing is very keen on is supporting those uh, who may become frail um, or maybe even end, end up with a diagnosis. Of, the dementia and the, the role of dementia friends through Dementia UK are obviously a really good example of, of the sorts of support services that can be can be put in place to to overcome um, loneliness as well. And then we've got Mental Health Awareness Week coming up and, and loneliness being the 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 big theme for, for that one. Um, so all of these things connect, don't they, Tani? There's a, there's a lots and lots of connections that and you, I love the phrase you use. It's about sort of kind of treating people as their as, as their whole self, and not necessarily um, the one tiny uh, kind of treating the the kind of the, the small part of the of the illness. It's actually kind of a, a much more holistic approach. Um, I was just going to say you talk about vanity, which is really interesting. So I, I really miss having triceps. I used to have really really cut triceps, um, and you know, okay, my age that doesn't happen in in the same way, you know. The bit of the vanity, I go to the gym now and I have to count the weight stack from the top, not the bottom, you know, and, you know, it, that's, that's, that's okay. And, you know, I kicked them all out of the way so you didn't see them behind me, but I've got so many stretchy bands in my house. Um, you know, I do, and I always did a load of stretching, but I, I still do because that's really important. And, you know, the weights and Gabby's spot on, but again, that comes back to education. You know, it's how do you know at different parts of phases of your life, what you're meant to do. and you know, um, I told my rotator cuff in lockdown, never did that in 25 years of sport and training twice a day, six days a week. You know, didn't. I told my rotator cuff by sitting like that at my computer and and slouching in lockdown. Um, and that was another one for me, which was like, oh, wow, because if I can't transfer, if I can't move my body, if I can't get in and out of my car, if I can't lift my own chair into my car, my life is radically different um and, and although it was quite a painful couple of months that that was another you know moment for me and i remember talking to the guys at uk active and saying you know this is it was actually quite scary you know you know trying to figure out what what i needed to 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 do um and actually exercise fixed it you know and and you know a bit of other support but you know it's again it's educating people to to know those different things that they need to do and i i have to say i'm, I'm going to do it i'm totally obsessed with rotator cuff exercises to protect your shoulders uh my daughter kayaks i tell every single paddler i ever meet you know wheelchair but you know shoulders are really important and you've got to look after them and yeah you can replace them massive horrible 
unpleasant operations and you know it's it's you know you you you've got to do that i i you know if i can't transfer myself i i'd have to have carers and i kind of want to avoid that as long as i possibly can it's, it's interesting that, that having that knowledge around different body parts and and their their, their importance and and just to pick up on something you hinted at um, just before that, um, it's accessibility to um, to support is important as well. So, for example, when I say support, I mean sort of um, I'm thinking of YouTube videos that teach you how to uh, do certain exercises. Right? In the past, we didn't have that. So it's it's the internet and, and kind of app, app technology. I, I'm thinking of kind of if I ever want to do a hip cl hip class. You've got the Jessica Ennis hit, uh, Jessica Ennis uh, hit class, for example, yeah. is a really good one where you, you don't, you're not on your own, right? And I think having those tools are, are really important. Um, just going to read out this comment from um, from one of our viewers. Um, let me just have a look. She said, "Hi, Tani. Thank you so much for a very interesting webinar. My 10-year-old daughter has type 1 diabetes and absolutely loves sport. Football is number one at the moment, along with tag rugby. But as you've said." There doesn't seem to be any support for young females to get into support, let alone those who have the additional challenge of coping with a lifelong disability. I feel she would, would so benefit from a boost of confidence with additional PE, and it really does make sense to, to her blood levels and the mental health that goes alongside it when she's engaging in PE. But like you said, there are so many turnoffs, not just for girls, but, but guys as well, when there aren't the correct facilities of funding to, to incentivize them to muck in. It would be amazing to see the next generation of young athletes, Olympian or Paralympian, fully supported and given every opportunity to shine. And that was uh, from, uh, I've got her name here, Helen Colbrook. But it's, yeah, it's a really interesting point. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I, I'm 52 and I, I kind of look, you know, I, I started competing in sport before anyone really knew what Paralympics was. I'd just grown up in South Wales. It was a really good wheelchair, um, Rookwood Paris, it was called Sports Club, which just had loads of, you know, um, not just elite athletes there, but, you know, kind of um, developmental athletes. And I kind of didn't appreciate um, what an environment I grew up in until I traveled and kind of went to other places. And and that really positive experience, P, my school was like really strong on PE as well and had an amazing head teacher, or deputy head teacher, Mrs. Jones, scared the life out of us, but, you know, it was always pushing girls to, to do things. Um, and then, you know, I think when I was probably 16, 17, I realized that, that other people didn't have that. So, you know, facilities matter, people matter, and the funding, you know, matters as well. You know, are we getting the absolute you know, best and most talented children moving up sports talent pathway. We, we get a lot of very talented people, but, you know, talent pathway stuff has now become really expensive. You know, the average cost a year, a child on talent pathway is 10 grand. You know, most families can't afford that. You know, the vast majority of families can't afford that. So, again, this is stuff that we have to do in a, 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 a different way. And I think, you know, um, you know, talking about conditions and talking about diabetes, and not everyone wants to do that, uh, and and people shouldn't feel that they have to. But but I think listening to stories about people who've experienced things and how they're coping with how they deal with it, I think is really important because it it, it helps others as well. Yeah. And um, what would your um, I mean, getting across the benefits of physical activity um, is like you said earlier. We're all aware of of, of the fact it's good for us. But what were the, the, would you have any tips to any of our viewers, some of them, many of them, financial advisors who may be sort of recommending uh, a policy like Vitality, which would, would, would encourage their clients to, yeah. to take up, um, you know, or increase their physical activity levels or make healthier choices. And I said yeah. earlier, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. So how would you get, get across as uh, succinctly as possible, kind of the, the, this is kind of what you've dedicated your, your, your life to, is getting people more active. So what would be the best way to do that? I think it's showing people you need to have a long and healthy life, you know, and, um, uh, you know, there are things that you can do as an individual to take charge of that and take responsibility for it. You know, we the, the reality is, you know, pre-COVID, we had a generation of young people who um, the, the chance they were going to die before their parents because of inactivity was was growing. 
you know, we know children lose 70% of their fitness in the six week summer holiday pre COVID. You know, the idea that all kids are out from dawn till dusk running around, you know, is nonsense. Um, and in 2020, children were out of school for 29 weeks. So if you're not going to do it for yourself, do it for your children, do it for your family, you know, just take that responsibility. And I, I think it is just, you know, you know, the idea, whether it's health insurance or whatever it is, the idea is that you don't use it, you know, um, and, you know, it, it's there as an insurance. But, you know, you, you don't want people to be living um, unhealthy, long lives. And um, I'm, I'm going to be quite crass in the way that I say this. So massive apologies. You don't want to hit frailty in your 40s and die when you're 80. You you want to hit frailty at 79 years and 11 months and then die, you know, yeah. and physical activity. And it's, it's a really horrible way of saying it, but physical activity is one of the things. And it's a really important part, part of that because living yeah. with frailty is is pretty miserable. I suppose it's about our health span, not necessarily our lifespan. You know, it's, yeah. it's about the number of years we live in good health, not just the number of years we live. Um, yeah. and, and it's taking steps and, and kind of doing the things that we can do to prolong that uh, for as long as possible, those those healthy years. Um, it's a difficult conversation to have with people. It really is. And, and would you say that now with, off the back of the pandemic, with, we touched upon how kind of getting active, nature, getting out, our health and well-being is kind of in the spotlight more so than what well, has been in the spotlight more so than ever before. The term being at risk, for example, during mm. COVID became, it took on a whole new new meaning. So we're much more aware of the connections between serious illness, prevention, um, and, and, and how if we're more, if we take preventative uh, action, we can, we can, you know, be better, better place to, to fight off illness, not just COVID. So do you mm. think now how have you kind of navigated the the opportunity? I, I used the term opportunity uh, lightly. Obviously, I don't, I kind of there's so much negative uh, and it's such a terrible time the pandemic. But but is there an opportunity to kind of use that to harness um, that kind of interest and, and and take it forward? Yeah, yeah, and and I I think you know although I've quoted some sort of you know some some massive challenges, we've got to use this opportunity to. Um, inspire people and been you know debating with people for, for years you know same with like the the warning on cigarette packets you know about it damaging your health you know there's a debate about whether we should put warnings on on alcohol labeling you know it's it's how you tell people um you know if if you don't do physical activity what are the consequences now i would be much happier trying to um you know talk to people about these are the benefits of physical activity but for some people and, and you've got to be very careful for some people telling them what will happen to them if they're not physically active is is the connection um and it is a it is a really difficult um line to cross if i'm being honest in terms of you don't want to scare people but but also you know right here and now um if i didn't do any activity today or tomorrow um i'd, I'd still feel you know i still feel all right I, I wouldn't you you know as elite athlete you you lose your fitness very very quickly you know every week you miss a training you go back a month the level i am now if i didn't do anything for a couple of weeks would you know the the, the drop could be quite slow but actually if i'm not doing the next two weeks the next 20 years is where i feel it so it, it just gets sort of kicked into the long grass a little bit so i i think the messaging and this is why partly you know group of us wanted to move sport into health is you could, a different opportunity to think about the messaging that that we we give to people about the importance of of being active um you know i i, I would love every single person to really enjoy being physically active mm. not you know yeah. so, but maybe doing it because it's good for your health is you know but but you i could, do i do think you most people you can have a better time of it yeah, and, and you mentioned earlier sort of the role of life and health insurance, for example, and, and also that most clients or members don't ever want to have to make a claim, right? We don't want to have a have, we always take out insurance as peace of mind is one of the main reasons. But what if they could get something from day one of that policy, you know, and that that gives them something back? You know, there's that kind of reward aspect. 
And what if the outcome is them living longer and more and more healthier? I mean, it feels like it's a, it's a, a real win-win, right? And, and I think if it's positioned that way, it can really um, enrich people's lives potentially. Um, well, there's so many, so many, so many great strands to that, Tanya. It's, it's been a really great conversation. Jamie Monk, one of the one of the Vitality coaches, has said in the in the chat, "Great work, Adam. Really enjoying the conversation. Tanya's passion for health and fitness is so contagious." Sport can change your life and transfer into so many different areas. And Tani clearly sees the importance of this. And as I said earlier, Tani, you've dedicated your life to it. And, and, and more, more great work to come, no doubt, in your new role as a chair of Sport Wales. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited. Um, uh, I grew up in Wales. Uh, I uh, Right time, right place, actually. You know, uh, amazing athlete who lived in South Wales, Chris Hallam, won the London Marathon wheelchair racer. You know, just lots of things happened. Uh, and, and and what I want to do is give more people the opportunity to have those things around, that it shouldn't be a postcode lottery, that it should be, you know, the, the chance to do do fun things. So, um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm really passionate. And I know I go on a lot about it, but, you know, um, you know, we... We we kind of do it, you know. I uh, I I I kind of want to live till I'm 120, and um, you know the best chance I've got doing that is being being active and keeping my brain working as well. That's really like really inspirational stuff. And thanks again, Tani, for joining us. Uh, I hope the the viewers have, have enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, thanks for tuning in. See you next time on the speaker series, and and have a lovely day, Tani. And uh, let's keep in touch. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks everyone, bye.